Hello physics students. So we just completed gravitation part one, where we studied and analyzed the motion of objects only under the influence of the force of gravity. Now in our analysis, we used two basic facts, facts which I told you were actually wrong. The facts are that the force of gravity does not vary with altitude, and therefore the acceleration does not vary with altitude. It's always exactly 9.8 meters second squared in the downward direction. False. The other fact that we use is that the acceleration in the horizontal direction is always zero, because gravity only acts in the y direction. Also false. The reason why those facts were 99.999% true for the motion that we, motions that we studied is because the scale of the motion was small, very tiny, compared to the scale of the size of planet Earth. In other words, when I just launched that tennis ball, and it moved from one side of this screen to the other, if I took a pin and I put it into New York State at the starting point of the motion, and then a pin at the ending point of the motion, the pins would be pretty much in the same place on the scale of the globe. So the motion was small, and we assume those facts were true. They're not. The true thing, the true facts are that the force of gravity actually gets weaker the further you go out. Okay, and therefore the acceleration gets smaller. Furthermore, the direction of the force of gravity does not stay in a constant y direction. If I do a gravity experiment in Hawaii, which is over here on the globe, it would look like this. Someone else does the experiment, the same one in Alaska, it's like this. Notice this direction is not the same as this direction. So the force of gravity direction changes as well when the scale of motion is large. So that's what we're going to do is now move on to larger scale motion, larger scale phenomenon where we have to consider the spherical nature of gravity. Not like in part one where we assumed through our assumptions that the earth was actually a flat infinite plane. It's a sphere, so we have to factor in the changing magnitude and direction of the force of gravity. So. That brings us to Newton's law of universal gravitation. Yes, it was thought of, Isaac, thought of by Isaac Newton again. Isaac Newton, so much of physics he thought of, this is just one more thing. So if you have two objects, mass one and mass two, a certain number of kilograms, they will attract each other. And by the way, they're separated by a distance r, okay, from the center of one object to the other. The first point is that gravity always attracts, it never repels. So it doesn't matter if you have a planet, a star, or a planet and a satellite, always attraction. The other thing is that Newton's third law still applies. I try to draw this arrow and this arrow the same exact length, because even if this is a little tiny piece of dust floating in outer space that you can't even see, it's pulled toward the Earth, there's an attraction toward maybe this is planet Earth with, I'll make up a number, 0.1 newtons, or whatever, I'll just throw out a number. The dust pulls back on the earth with exactly the same amount of 0.1 newtons. It doesn't matter which one is bigger, smaller, they pull with the same amount of force on each other. Then you can calculate the force of gravity, that attraction, by this formula. Capital G, M1, M2, divided by R squared. And I put the note there, it always attracts. Now what do these numbers mean? G, capital G, is what we call the universal law, uh, sorry, the, gravitation, uh, the gravitational constant uh, for, well, it's on the reference table, universal gravitational uh, constant. So if I go to the front cover of the reference table, uh, wait for the focus, right at the top you'll see that capital G value, and notice that uh, there are a bunch of units there, which you have to make sure you write down when you're solving a problem. Newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. The equation that I just put up on the board is, 
if we're starting in our mechanics section, scrolling up right there, there it is, okay, G M1 M2 over R squared. M, as I mentioned, are the masses of two objects in kilograms, and R is the distance between the two in meters. And a lot of people, if I say these two objects are two meters apart, they say, oh, that's the diameter. The radius is like half of that one meter. No, the radius is always how far apart the objects are. Because when it comes to gravity, very often there's an orbit involved, this going around like this. And that orbit traces out a circle. And so the distance from one to the other turns out to be the radius of the circle. That's why, or the radius of the orbit, that's why we use the symbol R. So just take the distance and don't divide it by two, plug it in and you'll get the force of attraction. All right, so let me create a pause to allow you to copy this down. Okay, what we're gonna do next is an example. Example one. Determine the weight of a 100 kilogram person standing on the Earth's surface. So the weight, again, a reminder from earlier in the year. Weight is another word for the force of gravity. So when you see this, you know FG, this is the formula. So I'm going to sketch a little picture here. Here's planet Earth, here's the person standing on the Earth. And by the way, this is way too big. This is a person taller than Mount Everest. If I truly drew the size of the person on this scale, we'd, I'd pick it, make a dot so small you wouldn't see it. But I'm exaggerating the size. So we plug in capital G off the reference table. Now, we need the mass of the Earth. Where do I get that? Well, front cover the reference table. So right here, let me wait for the focus. So I go up and... Let's see. And right here, radius of the Earth, mean radius is 6. Point, oh no, uh, where is it? Mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Later, I'm going to need the radius of the Earth, which is right here. So that's also mass and radius of the Earth on the front cover of the reference table. So there's the mass of the Earth. There's the 100 kilogram person, the two masses. Now, some people might be tempted to say, well, I'm standing on the Earth, so isn't the radius, the distance from me to the Earth, zero, because we're touching. Remember, it's the, the radius is the distance from the center of one object to the center of the other object. So, on this scale right here, we could see that it's this distance right here. That's little r, which turns out to be the radius of the Earth, which is here, I mentioned it's on the reference table. I punch this on a calculator and I get 983 newtons. Now, what you should do when I create the pause is also plug this into your calculator to make sure you get this answer. Often, students have trouble when it comes to exponents putting this incorrectly and they get an incorrect number. Make sure you can get this number, you know how to do it. If you can't get it, you're getting something different, then make sure to let me know and I'll help you figure out how to uh, do that on your calculator. So I'll create a pause, run these numbers through your calculator as a first check, and then copy this down in the pause. Okay, so that you might notice 983. And you might be saying, well, why couldn't I just do 100 times 9.8 get 980? Isn't that a fine, sufficient way to get the force of gravity of the person, the weight of the person? The answer is yes, it is, but that only works when you're standing on the surface of the Earth. What happens if you're on the Moon or Jupiter, some other planet? You can't do m times 9.8 anymore. You can put in the mass of any planet here, the mass of any person, the radius of any planet, and you'll get the force of gravity or the weight on that planet. That's why we say it's universal, okay? It works everywhere with all objects, not just Earth. Furthermore, we can find what the weight is of the person when they're in outer space over here. It's not always zero. It's zero when you're infinitely far from Earth, then you're truly weightless. But if you're up here, you can just plug in instead of 6.37, maybe it's eight times 10 to the sixth, and you plug that in and you get the force of gravity up in outer space. So it works in other locations. And also, it works even when you're not dealing with planets. Universal doesn't mean, just mean that 
it's how you find the force of gravity at other planets. It's the force of gravity between any two objects. Let me say that again. Any two objects. I'm an object and this tennis ball is an object. Do we attract each other with the force of gravity? Yes. Any two masses attract. So what we're going to do in the next example is we're going to figure out the attraction between two people standing next to each other. And obviously with more mass you get more force. So let's pick big people like a football player and a sumo wrestler. Okay? Figure out the force of attraction between those two. Which brings us to our next example. Example two. Determine the attraction between a 100 kilogram person and 200 kilogram person standing one and a half meters apart. So we use our gravity equation. First thing I want to mention is people aren't spheres. So this is not really going to be 100% accurate. In order to figure out the true force of gravity between two people who are like, you know, more arranged in their complex shape, you would need the force of gravity in a very complex analysis. More than what's involved in this course. Let's assume they curl into balls and they're like spheres next to each other, all right? It'll give us about the approximate force of gravity between the two. So I got a 100 kilogram person, which is like 220 pounds, a 200 kilogram person, which is someone over 400 pounds. Big, huge people, right? And they're one and a half meters apart. Here's the gravity equation. We use that same constant, 6.67 times 10 to minus 11. You say, well, wait a minute, that was for planet Earth. What's the constant for two people? It's the universal gravitational constant. It's for any two masses. This is always this number, 6.67 times 10 to minus 11. I put in the two masses of the two people, how far apart they are, and I get 5.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 7th newtons, which is this many newtons. It's less than a millionth of a newton. And a newton already isn't a big force. I could go with my pinky like this, and hardly any effort, I make one newton. So those two enormous people standing next to each other, are attracted to each other, but it's not like I have to hold them apart because they're going to crash into each other and I'm like, holding them apart. Because the gravity between them is so weak, they can stand next to each other and they don't even feel it. You wouldn't even feel this tug from another person. But it happens. Stand next to any person, you're attracted to them with the force of gravity. Stand next to your car, you're attracted to it with the force of gravity. But gravity, the point is, why is it so small? Gravity is an extremely weak force, okay? Because this constant is less, 10 to the minus 11th isn't even a billionth. It's a tiny number because the force of gravity is a very weak force. And you might be saying, well, I don't think it's weak. If a car parks on my toe, it's going to crush it because of the gravity. That's a lot of force. Okay, it is a lot of force for the car parked on your toe, crushing your, your toe. But think about this. That gravity pulling the car down on your toe comes from the entire earth. Every ocean, every mountain, every continent of mass pulling down on that car and it crushes your toe. Take out of the trunk one little jack, you could hold it in your hand, this is maybe 10 pounds or 15 pounds of metal. Put that one 15 pound jack under your car and start cranking it. And the little tiny jack wins against the entire earth and lifts the car up. One little tiny jack, entire earth, the jack wins. So the jack is using other kinds of forces that are stronger than the force of gravity. Gravity is very weak. You don't feel it with most objects unless one or both of the objects is extremely large. All right, so I need to create a pause. I want you to not only copy this down, but also run this through on your calculator. Make sure you get this number. If you don't, then again, let me know because you'll be getting homework questions wrong this entire topic, and then you'll be getting test questions wrong. You have to be able to deal with these big and small numbers. All right, so go ahead and copy this down. All right, some other patterns that I want to mention about the force of gravity. The first thing 
is a word called altitude. You need to factor that in, in your analysis. So, altitude, A, So here's a planet, and the radius of the planet, very often we use capital R to indicate the radius of, planet, uh, of the planet in Earth, as I mentioned, is 6.37 times 10 to the sixth. The altitude, what does that mean? The altitude is how far you are above the surface of the Earth. So like this, this is altitude A. So what you need to know is if you're given an altitude, the way you find the radius to plug it into the gravity formula is that distance from the center of the Earth to the point out there is R equals the radius of the planet plus the altitude. Okay, so that's what you need to know. Whenever given the altitude, add the radius to the planet before you plug that into the gravity equation. Now the gravity equation, it's in your notes, but I just uh, erased it, so I'll just jot it down again here. You see that the bigger the radius, the smaller the force of gravity, the weaker gravity gets. I already mentioned that. But let's suppose we're at an altitude of the radius of the Earth, or 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. So very often in a problem, they'll say an astronaut goes from the surface of the Earth to an altitude of 6.37 times 10 to 6 meters. What happens to his weight? And what you have to realize is that if this is the radius of the planet, and then you go to an altitude that's equal to 6.37 times 10 to the 8th, or in other words, the radius of, another of the planet itself, the little r is now doubled because we went from here to there, so our radius to the center of the Earth has doubled. And what that means is that the force of gravity is times one-fourth. Because if r doubles, what we have is r squared, or in other words, 2 squared factor in the denominator, which is a factor of 4 in the denominator, making a quarter of the gravity on the surface. If you're a 100-pound person, you go up here, you're going to be 100 divided by 4, only 25 pounds of weight at that altitude right there. Okay? Also, another possibility. Oops. A is equal to the diameter. I'm running out of space here, but here's R. The diameter is like this. So we go that altitude above. The diameter is actually R plus R. So, what we've effectively done is we've taken our radius and we've tripled it if we go to an altitude equal to the diameter of the Earth. So, R triples means the force of gravity is, is going to change by a factor of 1 divided by 3 squared, or it's going to be one ninth what it was at the surface. Okay? Oops. All right, if you haven't already had a chance, go ahead and copy this down, uh, and I'll create a pause. One last thing I want to mention. What happens when you tunnel into the center of the Earth? A lot of people think that when they look at this equation, 
that when you go to the center of the earth, r goes to zero, and that means the force of gravity goes to an infinite value. Because when you're dividing by zero, you get an infinite value. So people think that when you go to the center of the earth, based on this equation, the gravity becomes enormous. And actually, it's not true. So here's earth. And let's suppose you're right at the center of the Earth. What's actually happening in this case versus when you're at the surface is that at the surface, the force of gravity of the Earth tends to pull you always average out towards in the downward direction. Because there's some mass over here attracting you here, some mass over here attracting you here, some over here attracting you there. Add it up, it all averages out to a force of gravity towards the center of the Earth given by this magnitude. When you're in the center of the Earth, you have some mass over here. Maybe this is like the Pacific Ocean, and that's going to pull you here because you're attracted to that water, so you're pulled out toward the water. But over here, on the other side, well, what's on the opposite side of the Pacific Ocean? Uh, is it the Atlantic? Well, there's parts of the Atlantic shore. So over here, we got the Atlantic Ocean, and there's water over here attracting you this way. And then we've got water from the North Pole pulling you this way, water from the South Pole pulling you this way. Oops. And what you could see is that at the center of the Earth, you're pulled outward by all the Earth's mass pulling you equally outward. And so what that means is that the force of gravity equals zero at the center of the Earth. And this is really what we're talking about is the net force of gravity. If you're partway outward between the center of the Earth and the surface, you've got some mass over here on this side of the Earth. Well, maybe I'll do it in a different color. This mass, which is to the right of you, is attracting you like this. But there's a lot more mass to the left of you, which pulls you with a lot more force this way. So the force of gravity is not zero when you're between the surface, but it's a little bit less than when you're at the surface because some of the mass is actually lifting you away from the center of the Earth, this portion of the Earth. What that means is that gravity is actually a function in the center of the Earth. Let's take that example of the person that I calculated in example one. The force of gravity of that person is 980 newtons at the surface of the Earth. So I'm going to put capital R here, representing the surface of the Earth. This is the radius of 6.37 times 10 to the sixth meters. So that person had a weight of 980 newtons. At the center of the Earth, he has a weight of zero, and it's a linear function. In other words, the deeper you dig into the earth, the lighter you will feel until you reach the center of the earth and you'll be floating just like in outer space at the center of the earth, weightless. Net force of gravity is zero. But as you then go out away from the earth, then this formula is now valid when you're outside. So let's suppose you're at twice the radius, two capital R of the earth. So you're like somewhere right here. As we said, your force of gravity will be a quarter of what it was at the surface. So here's approximately a half, here's a quarter, 980 over 4. And so that will be my force of gravity there, and it will be like a 1 over r squared graph. So that should curve maybe a little bit more obviously. Yeah having a little trouble making a nice curve. And then at 3R, we will have 980 over 9 newtons at that point. So that is the true pattern of the force of gravity above the surface of the Earth, inside the Earth. That's what it looks like. Now, as far as I know, the Regents only looks at the force of gravity outside the Earth 
and there, force of gravity radius graph will just be that descending curve because they don't look into that what happens when you tunnel into the earth. All right, so that's it. We've begun gravitation part two where we realize that the earth is spherical in nature and that means when you go to a higher altitude, force of gravity gets weaker and when you turn, the force of gravity direction, direction changes as you go around the earth. So that's what we learned. We learned the magnitude of how you, we could calculate the force of gravity for as uh, uh, of uh, any mass to planet Earth for different radii, but we also learned that gravity is between any two objects, even two people. There's always an attraction, a mutual attraction, given approximately by this formula. I hope you enjoyed the physics. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you in the next physics video.